Good morning, folks. Welcome back to Management 760. I'm out on the veranda again. It's a nice Saturday morning here in Northwest Louisiana. Hope everyone's doing well. This will be Lecture 1B, so it'll be the first week uh, and the advanced lecture for the week. This will be the longest single lecture that we will do all uh, session, you know, the seven weeks long. And it'll be in two or three parts. You'll see how it'll be uploaded into uh, YouTube. But I think it's important that we get a snapshot of the entire course. We don't want to kind of piecemeal this thing because, as we'll see by the end of the seven weeks, strategy is very much an interrelated dynamic system. So if you go to slide two, uh, if you had a chance to read my uh, bio, uh, you'll see that I spent 25 years in strategy consulting before coming back to academia full-time. I've been here about six and a half years. Uh, and these are some of the companies that I've been honored to work with over the years. And to the extent we can, I'm going to try to weave in some examples uh, of these projects. Indeed, somewhere on here you can see Flower Country USA that we uh, discussed in week one. Uh, slide three is really my fractured PowerPoint of the main exhibits in the Playing to Win book. And uh, as you can see, Roger Martin and A.G. Lafley are going to build the position that uh, we have an integrated cas cascade of choices to make in strategy and for our strategy framework. And I don't think there's any better way to view strategy as an entire strategy framework than in, in the book Playing to Win. So in the upper left, what is our winning aspiration? Where will we play? How will we win? What capabilities must be in place? And then really important, what management systems and processes are required to actually execute the strategy? If you go to the next slide, you can see that I've got the arrows pointing, you know, uh, down and up and uh, what that's trying to signify for you is any one of these things can inform the other. So thus, it's a dynamic system. Sometimes in companies, let's say the how we will win, the third uh, box from the left, will come to be very problematic and we'll have to go work on that box. Well, sometimes when we change that box, we've got to change one or more of the other elements in the uh, cascade of choices. And in the, the next slide, you can see, again, I just, I just uh, uh, took this from the book. We can kind of flesh out what some of the key questions are in this cascade of choices. Uh, if you go to slide six, uh, we're going to have a discussion of what I think and what many um, feel is the single best measure of performance for a company. We'll see that discussion uh, next week uh, in the lectures. But for the publicly traded firm, and by the way, let me, let me back up. Some of you uh, are just coming into our MBA program in fall A. Uh, you've had, maybe you don't have an undergraduate degree, but you've got BADM 700, BADM 701. That's all you're going to need for this course. But we do need to discuss some financial concepts. And at the level I'm going to discuss them, you, have, you don't even need to take Finance 701 or Accounting 701 to understand uh, the key concept. So uh, total shareholder return is simply stock price appreciation plus dividends. And uh, so that's for the publicly traded firm where you can go out and buy their shares of stock. Some of you perhaps trade on your own account. And for the private firm that's not publicly traded, increases in firm valuation, what the value of the firm is. Uh, if it's worth $10 today, we're going to try to grow it to $20 tomorrow. The next uh, four slides tell a fascinating picture, and it is really a law of competition of what you're going to see playing out here. This comes for a great little book called Maximizing Shareholder Value and the Greater Good by Bart Madden. You can go on his website learning what works and download this very short little book uh, for free as a PDF. Well, if you take a look at the next slide, and I know it, it looks like a lot, wow, okay? Um, but the fit, uh, this is Bethlehem Steel, and if you go to the right of the next slide where it says CFROI, that's cash flow return on investment, don't worry about it. 
you'll notice that the, there's a horizontal bar at about 6%, and that is the cost of capital for uh, the firms in Bart's study. By the way, he studied 7,000 firms across the globe and found these relationships to hold true. Well, you'll notice that the bars in that, in that upper uh, quadrant to the right of the exhibit uh, are, represent the cash flow return on investment. You'll notice not in the 30 years of that data from about 1960 to 2005 did Bethlehem Steel earn its cost of capital. Uh, the, the bottom panel uh, called net asset growth rate, that's just simply year, o year over year the growth in the assets. So, you know, one bar from the next would be the percentage growth in assets year over year. Well, you'll notice some of those times they have negative bars. That means they are divesting of some assets in the company. So notice on the left panel then, through that same period of time, look at what happened to the stock price. Look at what happened to the number of employees. Look at the cash flows. Oh my gosh, that is, that's more than a roller coaster. Look at the bottom, now go to the bottom right where it says the relative wealth index. You'll notice all of these are going to start at one and notice through that time period the relative wealth index falls to you know somewhere around 0 .0001. Don't worry about what an index means at this point in time. Just, just relative to the next three charts that we're going to look at, uh, notice that it starts at one and goes way, way down. The key thing going on here and in the next three exhibits is the ability of a firm to earn more than its cost of capital. That is the ultimate benchmark for strategic performance. Earning more than, in this case, a 6% uh, cost of capital. Okay? So, uh, it will, if you have any questions about this, we'll, we'll have this in the uh, uh, discussion forum or during um, virtual office hours. So you go to the next uh, slide, and that is DuPont. Things are looking a little better. Notice in the 60s to, what, almost about 19... 67, uh, DuPont earned more than that cost of capital. And then way over there in about 2004, uh, they start earning more. You'll notice that through this period of, of uh, 1960 to 2005, they are investing assets. You notice the big spike uh, there, that's where they acquired a, a large oil company, which they later divested. So go over to the left charts again, notice the stock prices, notice the number of employees, and notice cash flows. Looking pretty better. Pretty better, is that right? Looking much better. And, but look at the relative wealth index now uh, on the bottom chart on the, uh, the bottom panel on the, on the right. Starts at one, kind of floats along at, at less than one. Not much improvement though. Walgreens, things begin to look even better. Look at the right top panel. Its, its returns are greater than the cost of capital all the way it looks like from about what 1983 uh, to about 2005. Notice the investment in assets they're making. Now flip over to the left panel. Notice the stock prices, number of employees, and cash flows. Can you see what's going on here? And then look at its relative wealth index back on the bottom panel on the right. Starts at one and goes up to, well, this is on a logarithmic scale, so uh, maybe 15. Okay, everybody waiting for the drum roll? Bated breath? Go to the next chart. And this is Medtronic. This is a strategist's dream, also an investor's dream as well. I wish I'd have owned stock in Medtronic. Notice in the entire period, they're earning more than that 6% cost of capital. Notice the, the asset reinvestment. They're investing a lot of assets up to about 1977, and then they don't make a whole lot of uh, investment until maybe 1998, 1999. That is an incredible story. And what that means is those investments that they were making up to 1977 
were just the right investments in assets where they could then reap the harvest, if you will, of planting those seeds of great bets, great assets to generate those returns over the cost of capital. Look at, look at the left chart then, the stock price, the number of employees, and the cash flows. And then look at the relative wealth index again. Starts at one and goes to just a little less than a thousand. If you look at the, the verbiage uh, down there in the bottom right, let's kind of read that together because I think it's very important. Bill George summarized his management approach as follows. The best path to long-term growth and shareholder value comes from having a well-articulated mission that inspires employee commitment. Companies that pr pursue that mission in a consistent and unrelenting manner will create greater shareholder value than anyone believes possible. There are simply no shortcuts to creating long-term shareholder value. Very important point. Sustainable growth cannot be achieved by a series of short-term actions. Real value can only be created by the hard work of dedicated, motivated employees that develop innovative products and services, establish intimate customer relationships, and build organizations over an extended period of time. Probably the single best paragraph that sums up the entire course. If you look at, the, uh, at slide 12, this comes again from Bart Madden, and you'll notice these are some of the things that he found in his research. Starting from the left, you'll notice that uh, economic returns, kind of follow the chart there, economic turns, returns go way up and then by the time uh, the, the business and perhaps the industry gets into maturity, it begins to fall and it falls to where it's lower than the cost of capital. Also what we know he found is reinvestment rates in assets fall during this period. And the far right he has a picture of what he calls the failing business model. We'll discuss business model uh, here later on in this lecture. Uh, where, the, where the firm is not earning its cost of capital. And we saw those in those charts for Bethlehem. So slide 13, again, don't worry if you haven't had Finance 701 yet. Uh, we can take a look at, at a general life cycle valuation model it's the mixture of operating assets, economic returns, how much we're reinvesting in the business, and fade, that's that downward fade through time in cash flow in the prior chart. Uh, it leads us to the right-hand side of that chart. Uh, that, By the way, that should be a sigma, which means a sum. So we sum over the firm's life. It's free cash flow, which is in the uh, numerator, and one plus the minimum required rate of return, which is the cost of capital that we've discussed. Don't worry about the mathematics at this point in time. It's the concepts that we're looking for. Well, slide 14 then shows, well, what is the, what's the way out of, of, uh, of this issue? The only way out is to have an innovation process that is going to continually bring new strategic initiatives that will reverse the downward fade with upward fade in free cash flow. By the way, don't worry about the title up there, EVA, that stands for Economic Value Added. You'll get to all of that stuff in uh, Finance 701. Okay, so the life cycle valuation model according to BART, three general rules. Avoid investments in initiatives or businesses likely to earn economic profits below the cost of capital, what I like to call the minimum required rate of return. MRRR. Reinvest in businesses likely to earn economic profits above that number and develop strategies that realistically produce favorable future fade rates. In other words, upward fading free cash flow and not downward fading. So what's the best way to grow total shareholder return or economic profit greater than the cost of capital? Uh, well, we can have financial maneuvering, and you'll learn about that in Finance 701. We can have mergers and acquisitions. Or the third point is we can have what, what we like to call organic growth. That's growing revenue from products and services inside of the company through good management, leadership, processes, people, technology, innovation, growth, facilitating organizational structures, appropriate 
financial and non-financial rewards, etc. Those kind of map on to the cascade of choices in the Playing to Win book. So the recent evidence suggests the third way is best, although the, the note I want to point out to you uh, is, is that all methods can, can be used at the appropriate time in established firms. So Henry Mintzberg wrote a, a great book a while back, uh, 2009, it was the second edition, called Strategy Safari, and there he outlined ten schools of strategy thought. Don't worry, we're not going to cover all ten. If you go to slide 18, we're going to primarily use the positioning school uh, to integrate all of those schools of strategy. And in the Playing to Win book, you will see an excellent application of the positioning school of strategy. In, in fact, indeed, the cascade of choices is at the heart of the positioning school. Uh, slide, eight, uh, slide 19, uh, which for some reason is not numbered, is a picture of the playing field that established firms and their rivals play in. And I like to call it the extended enterprise environment. If you look in the very middle, you'll see the case firm. And this semester, or this session, sorry, we're going to use Legos as our case firm. And notice to the left in that chart, we've got suppliers. To the right, we've got customers. And a whole chain of suppliers and a chain of customers. And then in around the figure, you can read all of the other various stakeholders that get involved with a with a case firm, uh, the firm that we, that we will be studying. Government agencies, investors, owners, trade associations, labor unions, standards bodies, go down to the bottom, whole array of potential substitutes for a product uh, or a service. So um, you're seeing a picture here of a very comprehensive game board in which a firm's strategy framework plays out. So go going to the next slide, uh, the extended enterprise environment is where the, it's a classic ac acronym of a SWOT and a PESTL come from, and we'll discuss those in Chapter 3 of the textbook. If you go to the next slide, SWOT stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats, and the PESTL uh, looks at more external uh, things that are going on in that extended enterprise environment, political, economic, sociocultural, etc. You can read for yourself. I also like to add global issues uh, when we look at, at some kind of a pestle analysis on a firm and its industry. So the last slide of, of part one of week 1B lecture is that strategy is different at two levels of any company. The first level is the business unit level and we'll discuss that in chapter five of the textbook. That's where businesses as businesses compete against each other. So that's where General Electric's lighting business competes directly with Siemens lighting business or Philips lighting business. So that's what we call the business unit level of strategy. The second level that we'll discuss in chapter seven is the corporate level of strategy and those are for companies that have portfolios of multiple business units. Think of General Electric. Goodness gracious, they are in everything from locomotive engines to broadcasting to CAT scanners in the healthcare industry to uh, Cap GE Capital, their own bank. They're in a variety of businesses and that strategy has a different logic than business unit strategy and we call that corporate level strategy. So this is the end of part one of lecture 1B. Stay tuned. Uh, welcome back folks. As you can see, uh, there's a white space here. I'm in my office and the reason for the change of venue, one is to just kind of uh, change things a bit, uh, but also I'm going to do a little bit of whiteboard work. Okay, this is lecture 1B part two. Um, we're going to start on slide 23, which is titled The Profit and Productivity Frontier. And the slide is not numbered, but you know it's 23 because it comes after 22. Uh, you'll notice that, that um, we've got two axes here. Uh, customer willingness to pay, 
and and the it goes from minus to plus. So that that that, that tries to designate uh, that the plus is customers have a greater willingness to pay in terms of higher prices. On the horizontal axis, we have relative total delivery cost per unit sold. So think of all the cost that a company um, uh, uses to produce its products and services divided by the units sold, typically over a year's period. If you go to the next slide, you'll notice that there is, an, is a curve. And let me start drawing these. And this is called an ISO curve. And what this shows is the positions that various competitors can take along what we'll call the PPF, or the Profit and, and Productivity Frontier. So I'm going to put total delivered cost per unit sold. And notice um, it would be plus for high, minus for low. And on this axis, we're going to put customer willingness to pay, WTP. And notice that goes from low to high. Okay, so high to low in terms of cost and low to high. If you go to the next slide, uh, what we know is, is that this, uh, the PPF will actually shift out over time. And what does the PPF represent? That represents the best state-of-the-art, best-in-class that that industry can be. So in other words, it's using cutting-edge processes, cutting-edge software, cutting-edge manufacturing equipment to get, at, at a current time period, the optimal total delivered cost per unit sold at the optimal uh, customer uh, to uh, willingness to pay price point. But through time, this curve moves out, and I'm going to show you some examples of how this works. Uh, the next slide is, is a, a, a practical tool that, that depicts the four Bs. I developed this in about 1998 with a team. And you'll notice it's getting better, getting bigger, getting broader, getting bolder. Those kind of map on to the, to the prior slide. So you can get a, more of a practical feel um, about uh, you know, the, the PPF moving out. And notice the, the direction for the growth in the market value of the firm. It's somewhere from the lower uh, left to the upper right. We'll discuss that in a minute. So let's, let's sh show you how this works. And what I would like to suggest you do to get this into your strategy DNA is get some, ideally some colored pencils or pens and write these curves out just so you can see how they work. So let's say we have a company positioned here on the PPF. Notice if we draw the lines, it has a relatively high total delivery cost per unit sold, but also what? A relatively high customer willingness to pay price point. Let's say in the retail space, this might be Neiman Marcus, okay? The high-end retailer. Here, at this point, notice total delivered cost per unit sold is much lower, but also is the customer willingness to pay price point, okay? But what we know is that firms in an industry are positioned along this PPF, and as long as they're not positioned too closely together, uh, everyone can have a fairly nice existence. Now, here is a... Uh, I'm sorry. So in an intermediate point might be J.C. Penney. And in 2005, I was honored to work with the strategic planning department at J.C. Penney, where we used this analysis. We found, by the way, they were positioned very, very closely to Kohl's. Now, what happens if a firm is not on the PPF? Okay. Let's kind of draw that in red. So. Let's say if we drew a, um, what is this, an asymptote maybe? Let's say we have a position, a, a company positioned here in red. I hope that's showing up. 
This is the second time I've done this, by the way, to hopefully you can see this a little better. So notice a JC Penny, and I'll put this in green, um, is positioned here. So it has a total delivery cost per unit sold. It has a customer willingness to pay price point. But notice if a, if a company's not on the PPF and that its position should be around here on the PPF, notice what, what happens. Relative to JCPenney, it's what? It's cost or higher. And it's willing to, willingness, customer willingness to pay price point is lower. Okay? Now, that's on the problem side. Companies like Apple have been able to push the PPF out, up and to the right. Let's take a look at what that would look like, and I'll try to do this line in blue. Okay? It, through time, as the slide says, industries will advance. New processes, new technologies, um, new approaches to manufacturing will allow, or, will allow, or offshoring the manufacturing, will allow costs to fall even farther and customer willingness to pay to be even higher. Let's show you. If we took the JCPenney position and we moved it to its corresponding part here on the new PPF, look what's happening. Costs are really falling and customer willingness to pay is rising at the same time. This is exact, exactly what Apple did with the iPhone. It's actually very relatively cheap to produce because it's all produced in China and the features of the very first iPhone were off the charts and people were willing to pay very very high premium prices. So if you go back to um, the 4B's chart you, you'll, you'll see then that as, as companies and industries move uh, from the lower left to the upper right, you'll notice in the getting bolder quadrant, the most exalted form of getting bolder is becoming the defining entity in your space. Firms like Walmart, Microsoft, Apple, Google uh, have enjoyed that exalted position. Okay, so I'm going to switch camera positions and we'll figure, uh, finish out uh, lecture 1B part 2. Okay, so welcome to my mess in my office. So. Continuing then on slide 27, you can see, uh, again, we're back to the, the two axis on the PPF uh, and two companies positioned at, at position A or B. The next tool that we want to talk about in our overview of the advanced part of the course is the notion of a business model. This came into the strategy um, literature and language in about 2005, primarily around new tech startups, you know, tech startups that were doing applications and that kind of thing. And it's spread everywhere now. And a business model is a conceptual framework that describes how a company creates, delivers, and extracts customer and shareholder value. It answers, asks and answers five questions. Who do we serve? What do we provide? How do we provide it? How do we make money? And how do we differentiate and sustain an advantage? There's a variety of business models out there now. There's a lot of peddlers of their approach to business models, but they all answer these five questions. So on, on the business model side and actually positioning on the PPF, we're really, we're really on the customer side or the demand side of the equation in strategic management and our strategy framework. So we, we want to continue asking which customers? Are they the end user? Or are they channels? So for Apple, we've got, if you have a smartphone, you're, that's an end user, and you either buy it through an Apple store or you buy it through a variety of other channels. Um, what are the needs, products, services, and features, and what relative price? Is it, are we gonna charge a premium or a discount price? Slide 30 unpacks the business model. I'm gonna let you read these for yourself. Uh, they're pretty straightforward questions, and they're great questions about a business model. The beauty of a business model is it allows us to create four or five different business models and varying, you know, answers to these questions. Who do we serve? Who are our customers? Will uh, one business model have us might serve the end user? Another have us might serve retail channels. 
How do we make money? One of my favorite parts of a business model is what do we charge our customers for? And also, I should have added here, what don't we charge our customers for? We can change that through different business models. And so once we come up with the, 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 the best business model, later on in the, in, the, in the course, we'll talk about financial modeling, but a very high level. Uh, we, we go over the best business model and we create a business plan, a strategic plan and financial modeling around our most promising business model. So slide 31 then tries to show in schematic form that at position A, there is a business model. Turn the slide to 32. Position B, in other words, company A and company B, might be on in the same industry but have totally different business models. Okay? And then when notice that the same company A at position A, when it's moving to a pushed out PPF, that could be a completely different business model as well. Okay? So kind of let's kind of sum up um, uh, what, uh, what we've discussed so far in 1B part two. What is a robust business unit strategy? Remember, there, there's a corporate level strategy and a business unit level strategy. So it's a unique path to customer value creation that forecasts and then actually increases shareholder value. One of the greatest phrases from the Harvard Competitive Strategy Group is it, the, the robust business unit strategy drives a wedge between cost per unit sold and customer willingness to pay. We want to try to make those be as far apart as possible. In other words, the lowest cost position and the highest customer willingness to pay. We have a defendable and sustainable position on the current PPF. You remember I told you that Kohl's and JCPenney, we found out, were positioned too close together? Part of the strategies were to have JCPenney move a little bit farther away from Kohl's so that it could, could be a more sustainable and defendable position. However, all this must be poised uh, to change as new opportunities arise uh, the, the robust business unit strategies, also innovation, growth, and execution capabilities to respond or create latent needs at the current position on the PPF. Latent needs are like what we had for the first smartphone, the iPhone. In, in uh, 2005, we didn't even need, know we needed a smartphone. Now, I think for most of us, it's a necessity. So that's what we call a latent need, uh, which sometimes are the, those are needs that customers don't even know they have yet. And then the hat trick is innovation, growth, execution capabilities to move the PPF out better and faster than any competitor. Apple and Google probably are our most recent examples. So you remember from chapter two, I believe, um, of the book, we talked about vision, mission, goals, smart goals, that kind of a thing. Um, those are not strategy per se, or it's not a strategy framework per se those communicate what the strategy is and makes it, one of my favorite words is visceral, in the gut, that, we under, that the people of the organization can understand the, the strategy framework because not everybody out there is gonna have an MBA. Lastly then, in, in part two, a robust business unit, that's RBU, strategy guides the appropriate decisions in the functional areas of the business. So what are the functions? Marketing, sales, new product development, I could add R&D, manufacturing, human resources, legal. The robust business unit strategy guides all these other strategies. If not, we'll have these functional areas going off and doing their own things, and I think you can see what the problem with that would be. So thank you very much and stay tuned for part three. Welcome back folks. Uh, as you can see, I've, we've moved from the office to back to the veranda. And uh, uh, I, this will be lecture 1B part three. Yay, we're almost finished. And by the way, today you may see in back of me uh, our 14 year old attack cat. Don't be alarmed, she won't hurt you. Um, she's going to last forever, we think. Okay, so picking up with slide 36, it's not numbered, but as you will know, notice that's the one right before 37. So heretofore, we've really been talking about the demand side of a strategy framework. Now we want to start talking about the supply chain. Well, you'll read about this in chapter four in the textbook, but it's the, the value chain is so integral 
to strategy analysis that I like to include it in the sort of this 50 slide um, synopsis of the entire course. This was uh, this came into the strategy literature uh, with Dr. Michael Porter in in, uh, in 1985 in his famous book called Competitive Advantage. And what you're seeing here are uh, a generic portrayal of how a company builds that value for the customers. And, and you'll notice the, uh, starting from the left uh, in the large boxes, inbound logistics to operations to outbound logistics to marketing and sales to after sales service, those are what we call the primary activities by which a firm creates value for customers. And also, by the way, creates financial value, as you'll see at the end of this set of slides. Uh, I'll tell you what the three rows mean in just a minute, but you'll notice up above the, the first row of the five primary activities, those are things called firm infrastructure. That's how a company is structured. We'll discuss that in Chapter 8. Human resource technology, technology development and procurement, overall supply chain uh, management are corporate support activities and these can support any of the five primary activities. You'll notice, let's talk the, about the three uh, uh, rows then under each of the five primary activities. The first row that starts uh, right under inbound logistics, materials handling, warehousing, freight in, and move to the right. You can hear a helicopter going overhead. I hope that's not too bothersome. Those are expenses. So remember, everyone has had BADM 700 or 701 or its equivalent. So you have a little bit of a foundation in, in finance and accounting. Those are the expenses, examples of expenses that we bear under each of those five primary activities. If you go to the second row, again, starting from the left, that says raw materials inventory, accounts payable, work in progress inventory, etc., that is working capital that we that we spend uh, and that we invest in. You remember from part A of this lecture, we talked about those assets that were, are invested year by year, uh, those, uh, uh, those um, uh, working capital, as it's called, is part of the assets. The bottom row, starting with warehouses, transportation, fleet equipment, and so on, that is our fixed capital expenditure. And those two combine to uh, uh, go into that, that those part of that chart in 1A that had the year-over-year -year percentage increase in assets. So that's how we build value going from right to left. And the key activities, so that's why we call these primary activities and support activities, the, the key primary activities are shown on, on slide 37 in what we call the linked activity set. This is so crucial for you to understand. And I think everybody's familiar with IKEA, the furniture retailer. If you'll take a look at the, the big circles in bold, those are IKEA's key points of differentiation. So they represent activities uh, in its value chain. Low price, the IKEA style. Both of my children, when they were in college, uh, bought IKEA furniture and instant gratification. The, the circles in the, in the lighter font, as you can see, are, are trade-offs that we make to reinforce that differentiation. Uh, one of the key things that we know in strategy is we cannot be all things to all people. Roger Martin in the book Playing to Win will come back to that time and time again. So you notice those, those things that support the three uh, key points of differentiation. Food care promotes long visits. That gives us more impulse buying. Uh, the stores promote heavy traffic and self-service. There's not a whole lot of people on the floor there. Uh, customers, when they buy things, they carry it themselves out to their cars, which all IKEA stores are located in suburban uh, areas so that they can have large parking lots. W uh, when customers take those things home, they put them together themselves. So uh, 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 down at the bottom there, uh, to, ha to reinforce that, we need to have full inventory at each store. Um, flat packaging is also just a way that it's easier for uh, the customers to get it into their SUVs or, or their vehicles. Um, so they have high, uh, going over to the right, high volume production, supports low price, supports in-house design, um, 
They, they source their inputs from long-term suppliers. They do, in fact, use cheaper materials in modular designs. So all of those are linked in a web, and here's the key point. It makes it very difficult for a competitor to copy all of that. Another example is Zara. That is a Spanish, in the next slide, slide 38, is a Spanish retailer that its whole activity set, its linked activity set, is built around speed. Um, they have moved uh, uh, from a, the typical in the industry, the retailing industry, is about a six month um, season change. They have this whole thing configured to where they can change everything every three weeks. So for instance, their key points of differentiation are moderate price, cutting edge fashion, and they appeal to very chic shoppers. Well, what supports that? Go, if you start at the left, advanced production machinery, flexible European factories, tight inv inventory control, uh, from the moderate price, what supports moderate price and, and cutting edge fashion is buzz locations, uh, excuse me, buzz marketing. Uh, to reinforce that, they need prime location stores. You remember IKEA needed sub suburban parking lots. Um, they need fast data flow. Uh, they have very frequent product changes, fast copy designs. And down there to the far right is scarcity selling, a very interesting part of their activity set where uh, customers know something may only last in the stores for three weeks and then it'll be gone. So I think you can see what, what we're trying to say here. Coming from the value chain, we pick those key activities and then we seek to reinforce them through a tightly interlinked, uh, very compatible set of activities. Going to slide 39, it's not numbered. Um, let's take a look then at three different value chains for uh, wheelchairs. And you can look them up, whirlwind at the bottom there. So you'll notice the primary activities in this example are chair design to operations to distribution to provision and fitting uh, provisioning is, is um, you know, putting them together, and then after sales, repairs. Well, a, a competitor in this space that we might call the refurbisher does no chair design. They collect and refurbish used chairs. They ship from the U.S., just going left to right. Uh, and the provision and fitting is they send volunteers from the U.S. and do no after sales repairs. Look at, you can read for yourself for the volume purchaser. Whirlwind on the other hand, designs chairs. Uh, it uh, partners uh, with, with other firms uh, to produce the design. Regional producers then ship to country partners. Local partners do provision and assembly. And yes, they do have after sales repairs. You remember from, from the first part of 1B lecture is these are also part of a business model design. So the business model and the value chain go hand in hand. They reinforce each other. This is a, a, another really neat example of, of uh, different value chains selling, again, the exact same service. In this case, with Hertz, Enterprise, and Zipcar, the, uh, the service of rental cars. So for Hertz, you can see, the, in this example, customer need, travelers far from home, they rent by the day. Pricing is premium because either companies pay for them or people are on vacation and you know at least for us we tend to go beyond our budget when we're on vacation. Uh, Enterprise, uh, they um, uh, uh, cater to replacement cars uh, at home where people rent by the day. Uh, the, the type of pricing is economy. Why? Because insurance companies pay uh, I, I should have said Enterprise got its start with renting cars for people whose cars were damaged in an accident or, you know, or what have you. Um, so uh, insurance companies will typically pay 20 days for the rental. Zipcar is very interesting. Uh, some of our students didn't know about Zipcar. They're in the major areas and there you rent a car by the hour. Their whole value chain there is no, there are no offices. There are, uh, there's no anything except for a corporate office with, with a bunch of servers because um, just like Uber and taxi cabs, 
uh, you, you, you sign up with Zipcar, uh, you have an account with them, you have your smartphone, you say you need a car for two hours, it'll download to your smartphone where that car is parked somewhere, let's say in New York City. Um, as you approach the car, the car unlocks, you get in, you drive it, and then it tells you where the next place to park. So um, value chain choices then under those three value chains and frankly business models. So office locations for Hertz at airports, hotels and train stations, enterprises throughout the uh, metro areas primarily in strip malls and no, none for Zipcar. Fleet choices for Hertz, full range of new models, sensible older fleet for enterprise and cool cars for Zipcar. And you can read for yourself uh, the marketing. So the, the point we're trying to make here and we made in 1A or uh, you know, yeah, I'm sorry, 1B part one is you can have a variety of business models and now value chains at various positions on the PPF. Now let's, let's take a, a look at the interesting concept of time and strategy. You know, you talk about vision and mission, you think about the longer term. And so let's take a look at, um, I think today is July 28th doesn't matter just put whenever you're going to hear this for the folks in two two sessions put put today's date in there and we've got a past and we've got a future and we also have a future of the future now I'm going to kind of be a little, little philosophical here if you go to slide 42 you'll notice when we get to the future let's say it's a year from today July 28th 2015 uh, at the future now is past and now let's go to July 28th, 2020 for future of the future. Then uh, at future of the future, future is past, now is also very past, and past is really past. Whew. That may drive you to drink, I realize. So if all now time and all future time, for that matter, ends up as past time, what should we do about future time? And what should we do about the inventory of past time? time. Let's go to slide 44, not numbered, um, and you can see where we can take a look at annual objectives and actions. You remember our discussion of SMART goals and objectives, midterm and then long-term breakthroughs leading to, to uh, some kind of a vision. Uh, you'll uh, be very keen to learn and, and have, a, have a view of this for Legos. So if all of this is true, when do we start working on the long term and the vision? Do we start today or do we wait? Okay, follow me here. Do we wait until the future comes to us and where that future time is now present time? Go to the next slide. How can the past help the now and the future? So what these series of slides on the interesting concept of time says we know in the established firm it's very difficult for executives to carve out time during the day to think about five certainly ten years down the road but for strategy strategy and a strategy framework to be sustainable we know that we have the executives know they have to spend a part of their week month year on thinking about the future the question is are they gonna let day-to-day -day fighting fires stamp out their time and energy to think about the future. It's a very vexing uh, pr uh, problem to solve. If you go to the next slide then as we close out uh, the last part of 1B uh, and this will be, um, f you'll, there'll be an assignment in, in a week or two uh, about Appendix B uh, in the book Playing to Win is a very nice discussion of why basically in the positioning school of strategy, there's only two kinds of competitive advantage that we can seek. One is the low cost provider or the low cost producer. And there you'll see on the left is the industry average price point and the industry average total delivered cost per unit sold. You'll remember uh, those are basically the two axes in the PPF. The advantage low-cost provider, and I say provider, by the way, because we would say low-cost manufacturing, but provide, we can also have low-cost 
firms in insurance brokerage law as well. That's why we refer to it generically as, as the advantaged low-cost provider. You'll notice that that advantaged competitor can price at the industry average, but notice where its total delivery cost per unit sold is. It's the lowest in the industry. And we know from research there's only room for one, the low-cost provider. Okay? Juxtaposed to that is the diff, I'm sorry, let me back up. The classic example of the low cost provider is Walmart. They wrote the book on having low cost. Notice we're not saying low price because Walmart advertises everyday low prices. They don't adver advertise the lowest price, but they have the lowest total cost per unit sold. The differentiator Think of that as a high-end company, from Neiman Marcus to Lamborghini to Rolex watches, whatever your favorite luxury good is. You'll notice again to the, to the left is, uh, and by the way, I think in that prior slide I may have said to the right, but look at the left, there's the industry average, and you'll notice the advantage differentiator is able to command a premium price. But we know this, it's more costly on a per unit sold basis to be an advantage differentiator. The key is the price difference from industry average is much greater than the higher cost position. And that's how the differentiator is able to get its profitability. Both um, competitive advantages are just as viable uh, or can be just as viable. In other words, in, in, in producing total, total shareholder return. Walmart does very well at that. Uh, so does Mercedes. So kind of rounding out here then, uh, we can put uh, our discussion together. We can go back to the value chain. Notice to the right, I've added a financial formula. And you'll find this invaluable as you, as you think about applying this to uh, Legos. What is sales or revenue? It's simply price times quantity sold. You'll notice we, uh, across the primary activities, we're, we're bearing operating expenses, we're, and we subtract that to get operating profit. We, we subtract income taxes. We add back depreciation and non-cash expenses. Don't worry about that if you haven't taken Accounting 701 and, and Finance 701. Then we subtract out of that the increases in assets we're investing in working capital, and the assets we're investing in fixed capital, you do all of those additions and subtractions, and the key number in strategy we're looking for is free cash flow from operations. We want that to be bigger than smaller, and we want it to be growing into the future rather than declining. The last slide uh, is just a blank um, format for you. Uh, for you to, to doodle on as, as we think about uh, Legos. So that ends uh, Lecture 1B, which is our advanced lecture. And as I mentioned, it's the single lo longest um, uh, um, lecture uh, that we'll have all session. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Hope hope you've now got a, a sort of a holistic picture of what we're going to be doing in the course. Cheers and take care.